Let's move this up here. Cool. So tonight, latent growth models. And um, the exciting part about latent growth models is it'll also allow us to talk about multi-level models a little bit. Now, Levon actually can do what are called multi-level models. It is not as great as some of the other programs that exist. If you're wanting to do a, a kind of a multi-level analysis where you have people measured um, at repeated instances, you want to use the same participants, you know, maybe across time other than what we're about to do, um, but you want to structure it in a slightly different way, Levon can do it mostly. But if you're going to do these sort of complex multi-level designs, and I'll explain what that means kind of as we go, if you're not familiar, uh, M plus, it's a paid program, but is definitely the one that does multi-level the best, as far as I'm aware. I keep hoping Levon's multi-level will get better, and I think they are working on it, but you know, open source, only so much time in the world. Okay. Um, but latent growth modeling really is the first time we're going to hit on this important kind of concept of repeated measures. Okay. And um, this allows us to measure change over time. Specifically with latent growth modeling, um, we're, we're measuring people across some sort of time span. But repeated measures design is anything where you have people um, give multiple scores. Generally, this is handled in our measurement model because we have one answer on each item, and that's not really what I mean by repeated measures. I meant like if you had them take it at time one, scale the scale at time one, and take it again at time two, you could treat that almost in a multi-group sort of way, seeing if, if it's the same after some intervention or something. But you have to control for the fact that this person is, t is in your data set twice. And so here, um, latent growth modeling allows us to do that. But let's say I wanted to test, um, for example, uh, I have some friends that are doing some research on, um, on depression and these intervention scales. And they have them take uh, a daily diary where they um, answer all these questions once a night. And we look at their change across time. For that, we could use a latent growth model because we're using time as our um, sort of question. Or it, it's not really an independent variable, but the kind of question of changes over time. If, however, we were just interested, we measured them across all these time points, but then we wanted to know, let's say, are you know men and women different? But I have the men and women at 14 time points in their study. What I have to do is account for the fact that it's the same person tested 14 times. But we're not really interested in time. We want to collapse all that information to one point, so to speak. So instead of averaging that, we could use what's called a multi-level model. That kind of handles this repeated measuresness. I have a better example. I just thought of this. So in cognitive research, there's a lot of times that we use uh, multiple stimuli. Okay. So I'm really interested in words that are semantically related and semantically unrelated, but I don't give them one of each. right? I give them like 50 of each. Okay. But my overall interest is in that global variable. These things are related and these things aren't. I could um, average them all together, collapse, get one related score, one unrelated score. But then I've just sort of completely lost all of the information about each item. And so a multi-level design allows me to keep each of those items and control for the fact that this person saw all those items. Okay. So that's what I mean by repeated measures. So if you're interested in the time component, you can do this in the latent growth style. If you're not interested in the time component, you can do a multi-level model. The conceptual uh, understanding of how these work with random slopes and intercepts is very similar. So I'm going to explain those as I go. Okay. So I really want to make a distinction between um, growth models, which allow you to sort of test time, and then multi-level models that allow you control for multiple measurements from each person. 
Okay, so now we're going to measure across time, big thing. And this gives me way more information than in my sort of traditional repeated measures ANOVA okay, or a regression line all by itself. So I could put this all into a regression where time is my predictor and tell me what happens. Okay. And a repeated measures ANOVA is just a fancy form of that um, special regression that controls for the fact that each person is measured multiple times. But a latent growth model really allows me to capture um, way more information than either of those two models give me. Okay. So some advantages. We can estimate our means and covariances separately, and you'll see towards the end of the lecture why that's really handy. Okay. We can estimate our observed and unobserved values separately. So we're going to treat the intercept and the slope, things you normally get from a regression, as latent variables. It's sort of an interesting concept because I could literally calculate the regression. It's a closed form solution. I could find the intercept and the line of best fit. But by, by treating them as latent variables, I can um, start to investigate other components to them. Um, so that makes it even more interesting. Now, there are some assumptions here. Uh, this is true of all the sim that we have done actually until next week, but especially for this, that there is some sort of continuous dependent variable measurement. If not, you have to do something else. Okay. And that just means that our, you know, we're estimating a slope, right? And you don't want that to, the dependent variable to be categorical there. Okay. There's some, some continuous measurement underlying system there. And you know, that's true for many structural models, is that the latent variable, the underlying latent variable, is assumed to have some sort of continuous, uh, not distribution, but continuous continuity <laughs> as, its, as its scale of measurement, is what I'm trying to say. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do SEM when that's not true. We just have to do a different type of, of estimator. So weighted least squares is really popular, ordered least squares also popular, um, and we'll look at a little bit of that next week. Here's another important key, that the time spacing is equal across people. This doesn't have to be perfect. I don't mean, I'm having a struggle with my computer, that the measurements, time measurements have to be the same. So it's not like I have to measure day one, um, everything on every day. Okay. My friends could do, I'm going to measure you on day one, day three, day five, day seven, where the spacing across the time there is not equivalent. That's okay. But people need to be spaced the same. So for one group, I can't have measurement on day one and day three, and then for another group, day one and day four, and assume that those two things are equivalent because you're, you're testing the changes here. And so if you have, give some people longer to change, that's a different story. So they should be roughly equivalent. I don't expect this to be perfect, right? Because um, often how we do these studies, sometimes they're called uh, ecological momentary assessment. I think I got that right, EMA. Um, you text them and you say, hey, respond to this. So it might vary by a couple hours, but we're not talking like, one group got it at two weeks and another group got it at eight weeks. That's very different. So the, the spacing between the measurements for people need to be the same. And you need at least three time points per person. Otherwise, you're actually just doing a dependent t-test. And um, while that's interesting and that actually does calculate a slope, that doesn't really work for structural models, partially because of identification. At least three time points to make this a useful analysis. And then, of course, large samples. <laughs> More samples, the better. But this data is harder to collect. So um, you know, may, may not have as large of a sample, especially because dropout, where people leave the study at different points, can be differential. So a large sample might help you make sure you have enough points across all of the people. So before we start, you have to think about, okay, 
I used to call this latent curve modeling until I realized that we weren't doing curves at all. It's really latent growth modeling. Okay. Um, so I changed the notes this year. But you have to figure out what you mean by growth. Do you mean linear growth? Do you mean carbolinear growth? Do you mean power functions? Right? You can do all of those. So you have to know what expected change um, should exist or proposing exists. And often this is linear, um, for better or worse, just because it's mathematically easier. But we could do carbolinear or power functions. And so starting to get into this more um, myself with sort of this idea of, of trajectory. So uh, in my friend's research, they have this idea that there are some people who just get better over time. Okay, so their scores are always increasing, generally linearly. Okay, so they're going up. And then some folks who like plateau, like do, 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 they're at the bottom, they're at the bottom, and then they get better at the end. That's a more of a power function. And some people go up and then down and then up and then down, so that's more of a curvilinear function. So I have to decide what type of change I can expect, and you can test multiple ones. We're going to focus on linear so that you can get the concept of how these models work. And so let's look at an example here. This is not the example we're doing, but this is a good picture of one of these models. Where, well, let's say we have three different measurements, and we're going to treat our intercept, or y-intercept, sort of average score if x is 0, if time is 0. Well, if time is 0, that's baseline. So where do people start? Right. As a latent variable. But notice how we're going to set all these paths here for a particular reason. The slope here of the change across all of these time points, they're assuming linear by creating this pattern of, of path loadings. Right? So we're going to set our loadings to something like 0, 1, and 2 to indicate baseline, first time point, linear change, second time point, linear change, third time point. And so you can space this out. So let's say you know it's, um, let's say we tested them at zero, uh, a baseline, okay, first time point, again at three months, and then again at 12 months. Okay. So you could do zero, three, and 12. That would represent that there's a longer time period between the second and third measurement than the first and second measurement. So the slope path coefficients, what we're going to do is set them to the expected time course because not expected measured time course and that way we can capture you know if there's one week between the first two measurements and three weeks between the next two maybe we expect the the change to be steeper in the second two measurements because it's just been a longer time so that'll help control for that facet if you measure them all like one day apart then you just do zero one two three four etc And so we're going to set our, our loadings here for our latent variables to specific numbers to help us e estimate an intercept and a slope, because that's what you're really interested in in the latent growth model. So let's talk about all the components you're going to get first, and then we'll walk through the models. Our intercept, when we build the intercept as a latent variable, here, we're going to set all of its path coefficients to 1. Why? Effectively, we don't want to estimate them because an intercept should be one number. Okay, and I, remember, a y intercept is um, the average score of y when x is 0. Okay. And so that is effectively when x is 0, time here is 0, is baseline. So give me the average score of y at baseline. And the interpretation for this is where people start. So where do participants start when they enter the study or whoever, whatever this is, right? You could do stocks, but stocks are stochastic. They don't, they're not linear, so not really appropriate. But you get the idea. It doesn't have to be people. But here, we're at baseline. Um, where do people start? And that's a really uh, useful question because then that gives you the frame for what happens with the slope. So let's say we're trying to get people to quit smoking. 
<clears throat> which is not a linear process, but let's pretend. So trying to get people to quit smoking. And so that this intercept, uh, is, in their, its interpretation is the a sort of average number of cigarettes at baseline for our study. Then the slope's interpretation is how much they're changing over time. So if the slope is negative two at each time point, we're, they're smoking two cigarettes less. And so this slope represents our change. Now, practically, when we when we build the model, you can set them to anything you want, but usually the first time point is zero, indicating start. Then each point after that represents some sort of mathematical understanding of how long between time points there is. So if you use um, 0, 1, 2, what you're saying is that they're measured at equal time points between 0 and 1. That's the same thing as 1 and 2 as, as our interpretation of ratio scales. I don't know if I have 0, 1, 3, what I'm saying is that it's been twice as long in that second to third measurement. So there's no slope at time 1, there's just an intercept. But what we're going to do is sort of abstract out the slope instead of it being you know, the slope between 0 to 1 and 1 to 2, we're going to kind of get the, the total change over time. So the paths themselves are set to the based on those time differences between them. And so we're really forcing all of the estimation onto the latent variable. When we had measurement models, we were forcing the estimation onto the loadings and the error variances. And this sort of model, we're working the other way. We're interested you know, in the, the um, latent variables uh, mean and inter mean and um, variance. Sorry, I couldn't think. Uh, so we're kind of working at the opposite end of the measurement model. We're setting all of the path coefficients to force our estimation to happen on the other side. So setting our parameters. So it helps us with identification, always. So that's a, a common theme throughout the whole semester. It's a theoretical match to the like traditional regression style idea of slope and intercept. Right? Um, so we could do these models as uh, multi-level models as well in, in like traditional like with a package like NLME or LME4 um, and get similar answers. The cool thing about doing this as a structural model though is it um, really allows for some more interesting estimation components. So there's sort of this missing, um, you know, um, what's called, oh gosh, I've forgotten. Right, we've been mostly been using maximum likelihood as sort of the default, but there's there's ways to uh, FIML, FIML, full information, um, maximum likelihood, where you can kind of guess at the best, uh, data points for the, the missing data. And so there's some, some other interesting ways to estimate than just traditional regression. This allows us to look at the variances rather than set them. And so that answers a bunch of questions. What is the average change for each person? Is there a slope or is it flat? Do people change over time, up, down? Where do they start? And I think the intercept is one of the least used interesting pieces in regression. We mostly ignore it. We focus and go like, oh, zoom, here's B. I want to know what the slope is and is it significant, right? Is this predictor useful? We also sometimes forget that that intercept, while maybe not um, interesting in a statistical test, right, is it different from zero? That may not be an interesting question, but it is interesting to know where people start often, especially in these types of studies where you're measuring them across time. And then how does that change over time? So um, this is, again, a slope question. What is the form of that change? So is it linear or is it curvilinear? Um, and then this question, is the average slope and the average intercept actually a good fit for all people. So one problem with traditional regression and ANOVA, 
Wikipedia measures ANOVA, is that it assumes um, sort of homogeneity in the intercept and the slope. And I think if you've ever done a couple of regressions and looked at the um, residuals plot, there's often not homogeneity, right? There's, um, or homoscedasticity, right? There's this variable uh, variability in our ability to predict at different levels. So heteroscedasticity is when um, you're trying to predict each value of, of y at every value of x, and some of the x's you get really good and some of the ones you don't. Right? So you get this kind of megaphone shape in your residuals plot. Well, it might be because there are different slopes for different folks. Okay, I'm done being cheesy. But the idea here is that different participants have these different sort of reactions across time. So some of them go up a whole bunch. Some of them go up less so. So my friends did a study on international graduate students, no, just international students, like at the beginning of, of all this um, COVID stuff. And what we found was that there were some participants in that study who had just like no reaction. <laughs> like they just were plodding along, like no, not like nothing had happened, but their, their sort of stress and anxiety was just kind of flat. They were all right. And then some participants who started way high and then went down. That implies that there are different slopes for different participants. Now, usually you want to try to predict why there are different slopes for different participants, but sometimes you just don't know. And this analysis will tell you if what's called a random slope is a better predictor. Okay, we hope not because we want our variable to be the reason that the slope exists, but it's good to know if it's not. And um, a random intercept is this idea that people start in different places, which, duh, right? Especially when measuring participants who may just have different life circumstances, if you're going to talk about stress and anxiety, right? In, in some of my research, when we're looking at response latencies, some people are just faster at clicking a button on a computer than others. And so this really allows us to account for these different pieces of variability that are just generally ignored in a regular regression. So is the average slope and intercept good for everybody or should we account for these the variability between people in a different way? This is one reason why I love multi-level regression. <laughs> it is so powerful at, at really answering some of these questions that we often ignore by averaging down the data. So if I had, you know, 50 words that I was measuring for each person, I used to just was like, give me one score, two scores for each person, related and unrelated. And now I'm like, I got 50 scores for each person. Let's see what's going on with it. Let's me explore a lot more. And that concept is called a random effects model. Okay, the random effects models um, allow you to estimate a fixed intercept, which is sort of the average score for everyone, and then also estimate a, a random intercept for each person. And what we'll look at here is the variability in that intercept to determine if that variance is quite large. Okay. So if the variance of the intercept is really large. That implies that people start all over the place. Some of them are really high, some of them are really low. In a traditional multi-level model in like let's say LME4, it's a really popular package, you would actually get the the actual intercept for each person. In this framework we would just see how much it varies. We'd have to actually build this as a, a real multi-level model to, to get a number for each person, but understanding that variance is interesting. Um, and then a random slope is the same way. We could calculate the, the slope differently for each person. Um, but in our case with, with the latent growth framework, what we'll do is just look at how much that slope has, has a variance. And in this scenario, we want, we hope that the slope doesn't have variance, which implies that everyone was acting in the same way. Or maybe you do. Maybe you're interested in the fact that it's different, right? 
So it's kind of an interesting question either way. Um, and if you do, let's say you find out that everyone's slope is different. And we seem to see that there are a lot of people who have similar high slopes, and a lot of people who have similar flat slopes. What makes that happen? Right? Why do some folks have no stress and anxiety response, none, zilch, right? if they're resilient to change? Um, and some people who start high start to come down. Can we figure out, which sometimes people, uh, clinical folks call these trajectories, can we figure out what predicts those trajectories? So that leads you to new interesting sort of research questions. Uh, and you can see this also, you know, let me think of a business concept here. Um, uh, you know, why, why do some things start uh, slow and then get hot, right? Or some things start really awesome selling wise and then trail off. Like you can see if there are different patterns based on the time of year, that kind of thing. And so I include this picture um, because it kind of helps you visualize what I mean by random slopes and stuff. Okay. So um, the intercept mean for participants is the um, average starting point at baseline time, time one. Okay. And so in a fixed effect regression, this would be point A. The slope mean in our latent growth model is uh, B, they have it here as beta, but it really should be B, um, where it's the change over time. So this would be people decreasing. Okay. So average increment or de decrement, like either way, um, across time points. And so this is where you have to kind of pay attention if you maybe need a curvilinear model because between time point zero and one, maybe it's like small and positive, but between two and one and two, it's like large and positive. So then a curve might work better. Um, and the intercept variance is more like this model over here, a mixed effects or a multi-level model. The problem with multi-level models is people call them 10 different things. Mixed effects, hierarchical linear models, multi-level models, for our purposes, all the same. Um, so the intercept variance, right? So if we add this random intercept, what we're doing is we're allowing our, our three different participants in this example to each have their own starting point. So we're, we're just going to say, you know what? It's okay if they start in different places. We kind of expect that. That's a natural human variation. But in this study, we expect them to all change the same. So we're going to say, okay, their intercept is, is random. They all start somewhere different, but they have a fixed slope. So you see all the slopes are the same. Now, that might be an untenable assumption, so we might um, uh, actually add a random intercept too, but let me say this first. So large variance scores indicate a lot of spread. People start in a lot of different places. Small scores closer to zero indicate a very small spread, okay? um, showing that everyone starts in about the same place. Okay? If the variance is literally zero, everyone starts in exactly the same place, which is either a design in your study <laughs> or investigate some more, because that could be a little weird. Because okay? I don't know that I expect everyone to be exactly the same. I almost, I personally almost often expect there to be large differences at baseline. Not large, large is a relative term here, but noticeable differences because people are all different. Even if you were tracking, let's say, product sales over time, you would expect those to maybe start in different places. Now let's also talk about a random, a random slip. So we could do a model down here that starts everyone in the same place, but then has different effects. So our red dots here, no effect, flat slope. Green dots here, it's negative. I think this is either blue or purple, is even more negative. So you get this fan effect for people. We won't actually do this model in our latent growth. We'll, we'll skip that one and go straight to a completely random effects model. 
in a completely random effects model, you allow them to start in different places and you allow them to change different ways. So, you know, this person here has a large negative change. Our kind of blurple, blue, purple line here has no change. Okay, and then our red one has a slight negative change. Often, this data is considered heteroscedastic because people, you can't the change, you know, uh, I want, if you calculate the average here, okay, this particular graph is not heteroscedastic, but, um, you know, in a real analysis, you might be good at predicting here at the beginning, but not at the end because people are changing in all different directions. And so this allows us to begin to explore why are they changing in different directions. So in a slope variance context, small variances mean that everyone's slope is changing in approximately the same way. Large variances mean that people are changing in lots of different ways. And this is similar to what we might consider in an interaction. So maybe there's another variable along with time that really predicts why some people are going up and some people are going down. And that's usually what we do when we see this kind of effect we usually try to figure out for an, another study, what variable is it that basically clusters people into no change and big change, right? All right, last but not least, to me, this one is very tricky. And I tried to write out like <laughs> the different scenarios for this, um, but this is an easy, thing to get confused on. I mean, I confused myself on it. So the last thing that we can do is calculate the, it, the, the covariance between the intercept and the slope. This is something we don't really get with our regression style analysis. And so let's say we have a positive covariance and a positive slope. So we've decided that people are going up over time. But there's a basically a positive correlation between the slope and the intercept. That implies that people who start with higher intercepts have higher, steeper slopes. Because it's a positive slope, so they're going up, and a positive correlation with the intercept. So higher intercepts are tied to higher, steeper slopes. The problem is when it's negative. <laughs> so the covariance is positive, but the slope is negative. Okay, so they're going down. But people who start with higher intercepts still have higher but negative slopes, so they go down faster, larger negative slopes. So they have larger slopes, but they're larger negatives, and that means they're going down fast and steeper. Now, a negative covariance and a positive slope indicate people who start with higher intercepts go up slower, okay, so they have smaller slopes because it's a negative covariance. Okay. So high intercept is with this low slope. And then the negative-negative scenario, people who start with higher intercepts have uh, flatter negative slopes. Okay. And so that's kind of the two-by-two <laughs> two square of interpreting this. Because I have a hard time when I look at it, like, what does this number actually mean? So I usually go back to literally this slide. I'm like, okay, I have a positive slope and a negative covariance. So people with higher intercepts just kind of have flatter slopes. But we could also find out that our, our um, covariance is not significant. Right? There's no relationship between intercept and slope. So let's try it and talk about all the models. So for this, I don't have any good full data, unfortunately. Uh, I have an example from the book, and then for the assignment, I have some examples from a friend's research lab. But let's look at crime data. And for these models, you do have to have at least the um, covariance or correlation matrix and the means. You can't do this without means. So we've got the covariance matrix of four different time points for measuring crime and the um, means of each time point. So, you know, these kind of look like they're going up across time, if I just visually look at the means, but can we test if it's going up across time? 
and I just call these time one, two, three, four. And that's how the assignment is set up too. So a new function, we're gonna use growth as our function, which helps us set up for the latent growth model. There's one of those C's, I didn't change. So latent growth model here, and it helps you sort of fix the parameters correctly. So the growth function, is just a special instance of, of the sim or Levon function that, that specifically goes, okay, we're doing growth here. And we'll use this data as covariances and means, but it does have the data argument. So you don't have to convert first. You can use the raw data if you have it. So it's very similar to our multi-group models that we did before, only it's reversed. So in our multi-group models that we did last week, we started with the least restrictive model and slowly got tighter and tighter, our pancake noose, right? So we may must both be pancakes, can't be bagels, must both be wheat pancakes, must both be wheat chocolate chip pancakes, right? We got more and more restrictive. Configural variance, um, scalar metric and residuals, right? Latent growth models actually work the other way. We're going to start with the most restrictive model and then loosen up. So... Um, Start with the most constrained, the least sort of number of things that one can estimate, and then slowly let parameters go free and see which model's best. And we would actually prefer our unconstrained model to be the best with the caveat that the covariance, if it's not significant, is much easier to interpret. Because the unconstrained model is one where the slope and intercept have both shown to be useful avoiding the word significant here, but useful model fits better. And the, un, uh, bleh, the variances are low, indicating that we probably have the same pattern of slopes and intercepts, because that's easier to interpret when people have uh, very similar patterns. So let's start. We'll start with an intercept only model. If you've ever done any multi-level modeling, um, this is going to be very similar, depending on your approach to multi-level modeling. There's a really great chapter in Andy Field about this kind of thing, and it works in the same pattern. So we're going to start with only our intercept. Okay. So give me the mean of the data at time zero. Okay. And I really want this model to be the worst, <laughs> because if this model is the best, that implies that no one has changed at all in the study and everyone's score can be best modeled by the mean of all the data and i can see some scenarios where that is use that's good and useful but generally if you're testing latent growth you're interested in change so maybe you don't want change you don't want a model with no change to be best now we're also going to constrain the Intercept variance, so this is a fixed intercept model. Okay, we only get the mean. We don't allow anyone to vary here. And then we're also going to force all of our residuals across time to be the same, which implies that the, the error in prediction is equivalent across all of our time points. This is kind of like a test of homoscedasticity. So we're predicting equally good or bad at each time point. Now here's how we set that up. Okay, so we're going to do I here for intercept. You can call this intercept literally typed out if you want. Um, but it's our normal latent variable setup equals tilde. But notice that in front of all of these we have one times plus one times plus one times. Okay. We're fixing all of the um, loading parameters to one on purpose. We're setting the intercept variance here to zero. So I tilde tilde I is the intercept variance times zero. So don't allow it to vary. And then we're fixing all the time residuals to be equivalent. And we're not setting them to a specific number, but setting them to be equivalent. So that's R here just for residual. Make them all equal. Now I could call this cheese to kind of round out the number of cheese jokes I can make in one semester. Um, 
but you know, R hopefully makes a little more sense for our residual. So the only numbers we're going to get here is the mean for the intercept and one residual number. Just sort of weird. We've been like calculating tons of parameters and now we're going to like hone in on two. So the function here, growth. And for our first model, okay, I've set my sample covariances, but this also could just be data equals crime if I had that. Um, brain fart, give our summary here. And I want you to see, first of all, look at the CFI. CFI mathematically should always be bigger than TLI. So in this scenario, this is no good, <laughs> right? Something's wrong. Uh, our RIMC is 0.5. This is easily one of the worst models we've built all semester. But that's actually a good thing. I want you to see how empty this is. Right? We forced all the loadings to one on purpose. We forced all the intercepts here. Now this turns on mean structure. So this is a, basically a CFA with mean structure. Um, we forced all those to be zero. We have one intercept for i, so this is the average starting point for our crime variable. We got no intercept variance and one residual. They're all estimated the same. And so we were, we're left with two numbers. And then I want to show you, um, I made a, um, you have to do PAR here. You can't do standardized because uh, there are some NANs here right, because of the model that we're building. So, uh, but you notice here that our standardized is basically the same. You can't print infinity here. So to, to diagram this, it's better if you just do the unstandardized parameters because that's in the, the scale of the data. It's more interesting. But you can kind of see like how much we're not estimating. Right? None of these paths, we just have the intercept. So there's no slope at all. All these are zeros. Okay, we've got two numbers. So what I've done uh, across these slides is had two table setups. Okay. These are very similar to the tables we've already been making. Um, so I won't beat you over the head with this, but we've built a, a blank matrix. Okay. I'm going to have five models and six columns, and I'm just throwing in our favorite fit indices into these. So we can see that this model is really, really bad. And we'll compare it to our other models as we go. The other thing we're creating is a, a set of table parameters for comparison. Now this is going to look kind of bonkers when I set it up because um, we're going to have five models and um, seven components total that we're going to um, estimate. Okay, so we've got our intercept mean, our intercept variance, our residual variance, slope mean, slope variance, and covariance. And then for each one of those, I just gave you the code that would pull this out of the parameter, parameter estimates table, if I can talk. And there are probably more elegant ways to do this with Broom, but um, what I did was I grabbed the parameter estimates here. And just a reminder, that's just the table that includes... Um, which parameter it is, and then it's like a table of all of these collapsed into one. And I told it, okay, this is my intercept only model. The first thing I want to grab is the intercept mean. Well, to do that, I have to look at the intercepts intercept, which is a little confusing to say, but that is the 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 mean of all of the of the start points right so to do that the left hand side is i and the operator is tilde one so i'm just doing some fancy subsetting here and grabbing the one row that has i tilde one in it to make this hopefully way more concrete wait that's the assignment sorry One second. Do, do, do. Let's look at this. Oop.
Oh my gosh, why is Simplot take so long to load? Good grief. Windows. Okay. So let's look at um, crime bit one, right? Dot par for parameters. Right, so this table, I think we've looked at this a couple times. But essentially what I'm doing is some subsetting. Okay, well I want only the one that has an I, okay, which unfortunately time has an I. <laughs> and then I want the operator where it's tilde one. And so this just allows me to grab this estimate. You could also use filter and deplier and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just like base R most days. So I, I grabbed that estimate. Now there's no estimate for intercept variance, so I just put an X there. There is one residual variance, so I said grab the one that's at time one and has two tildes. The residual variances are forced to be equal. So time one's residual is the same thing as time two's. So just grab the first one. And then there's no more other things, so XXX. On all of these, I tried to hit enter each time so you could see this is like column one, column two, three, four, five, six, just to help you kind of visualize how we're putting this into the table. So what does this tell me so far? First thing, where do people start? Well, this is crime data. So it looks like on average, there are um, whatever metric this is, five crimes per, per, hun per hundred, for example, um, in this, this town. So I'll say we're gonna look at uh, five crimes per hundred, <laughs> may not be the scale, but let's just pretend. Uh, let's say let's look at um, where Allentown. Right? This is a city I live close to that apparently has a higher crime rate. And we're looking at property crimes. Okay, so five per hundred. The error variance here is 0.6. So you know we're predicting um, predicting across time, but missing making every type point 5.3. But I don't have any good feeling yet if that error variance is any good or bad. So we're going to test that some more in some as a future models. But the average crime rate at baseline, at time zero, is 5.35. Now let's say, you know what, this is actually a bunch of different cities. So I expect the cities to all have different rates. Right, so Allentown's probably going to be different Chicago, which would be different from Philadelphia. What other northern cities can I pick on? Uh, different from New York. Right? Maybe that's different from L.A., from Houston or Dallas. I hit New Orleans and Atlanta. I, I missed most of the, the Midwest and, and the sort of big, beautiful open areas. Denver, there we go. Okay, So these are all going to be different. So we should probably let them all start in different places. And that's a random intercept model. So we're going to allow that intercept variance to be something other than zero because we expect people to all have different crime rates. So people can start in different places. And um, the predictive variance, the residual variance at each time point, though, is still the same. So yeah, they can start in different places, but we can still predict the error variance is going to be the same at each time point, which at this point, moment is not a good assumption, but we're only going to free one parameter at a time. And so this is the random intercept model. So we're not looking at residuals yet. Still no slope. And all you do when you write the code is you actually take out the line where it says i tilde tilde zero times i. So we fixed it to zero before, and now we're like, do whatever you want. And in theory right now, the slope is there, it's just fixed to zero. We just didn't type that out. So this is the most constrained model we're working backwards, releasing them, so let the intercept variance be estimated now. All this is the same, really. We just change out the models. And we're going to get one new one, but check it out. We're doing a lot better. <laughs> a lot better. And this is normal, that it will jump up a lot because having no intercept variance is, again, like a, not a very good assumption. Okay? We should assume at least some variance. If this is bigger than zero is, is um, a question your model um, may not get this much better, 
but it should normally still improve. So let's come down here and let's look at that variance. And what we see is um, about a half a point. Now this is variance, so we might have to take the square root to think about this in standard deviation form, but right there's still a good set of variability here from 5.35, but some of them are going to be, you know, 0.48 points lower and 0.48 points higher, or the square root of that. So this is um, variance and not standard deviation. So we would just put this in our table. Okay, it's way better than model model one. This implies that the um, intercepts do vary as start points vary. And then we can now fill in the intercept variance. The nice thing about the tables from, from, for the parameters from model one to model two to model three is they mostly um, stay the same. So what I did here was just change this to crime fit two. There is a point where you have to do a little bit of extra tweaking, um, but you'll see it as we go. Okay. So how would I interpret this model? Well, my interest of this is still the same. So I still have an average of 5.35 crimes at my starting point. But notice what's happened here. That residual variance, that error term, has now moved. It's no longer error because we're accounting for it as the variability in where people start. So we're taking that error and literally shifting it to the intercept variance, if that's where the error is. And right now, that is where some of the error is. So now we've accounted for what normally is noise by saying, well, everybody can kind of start in a different place. And notice here, too, like it is literally pick it up and move it over here. Okay. So those add up. Cool. That's good to know. It's helpful to know that these are not all the same across uh, at time one. But let's, let's add some slopes now. And it's actually uh, flipped from the intercept. We actually add the random slope first. So you say, you know what, there's a slope there, but maybe everybody is a different slope. So, you know, do whatever you want. And so what we do is we set the sort of average slope to zero. So this tilde one here, so it's slope tilde one for the sort of average slope that we would normally see in our regression coefficient output. And we multiply that times zero, saying don't really give me an average slope. I don't want to know what overall the score is. Instead, um, allow that slope to vary and just calculate the variance for the slope. The other thing we're going to do, since we do one parameter at a time until the end, is um, set the slope and intercept as uncorrelated. I don't have that question yet. So right now, just like add a, add a random slope. Allow everybody's slope to be different. Okay, I don't want one slope, I want a bunch of slopes. Okay. And for that, we're gonna calculate the variance of the slopes. Um, but leave the intercept stuff alone. So we're, at, we're um, loosening up the model, so you don't um, go ever go back to the original. You just keep changing it. And we're keeping our residuals constrained to be the same. So let's see, how does this model fit? Okay. Well, it's made up data, so it's getting even better. And we'll see that we've got a new piece here, slope, set to 0, 1, 2, 3, because this is like month 1, month 2, month 3. No covariance just yet. No average slope. But a variance for our slope. Now, is that a lot? I don't know. I don't know yet without seeing the slope. I know that there is some variability in the slopes, <clears throat> excuse me, because this model is better, okay, if I fill in my fit indices, um, this model is better if we use our CFI change of 0.01, right? This model's a lot better. So it implies that at least having some sort of slope is good. But what we're saying here is that there is some variability in the slopes, probably. And, you know, we'd like this number to be kind of low because in a prediction world, it would be nicer if our, if our predictor 
didn't have a lot of variability, right? So like this is the slope. On average, like pretty much everybody is the same slope. If we say that um, that everybody has different slopes, that makes it much harder to predict folks. But something here is better than nothing, which is cool. And what I can see is, okay, these numbers should start to, oh, they'll change a little bit here and there, but they should mostly kind of stay the same. They won't be perfectly invariant, right? meaning they don't change at all, but they shouldn't change too, too much. Okay. Um, but we see we have a little bit of slope variance. To me, this number seems small, but without knowing the slope's mean, right? if the slope is 2.5, that number is really small. If the slope is 0 0.02, that number is quite large. So we've got to calculate the slope's mean to know if this is a lot of variance or not. Now that parameter, addition of that parameter, improves our model. So it's better than zero, but practically is that better than the average? So let's see. The next slope we add, is, or the next parameter we add, is the average slope. I didn't really have a good name for this, so I just called it full slopes, meaning you'll get the, the slope variability, so you'll see how much people vary, but you'll also see the mean, the actual slope itself. Okay, the fixed slopes and intercepts is what I should have said. Okay. And so we're going to allow this both the slope and the intercept to vary, and keep our residual variances the same. Now, I lied here, we're adding two parameters. So we've added the, the average slope, but we've also allowed the slope and the intercept to vary. So before we've been adding one at a time, this time we actually added two. And what I can see if I scroll down, model, oh my goodness, this is approaching fake data, right? It's a really good model um, on all of our finitices, but let's scroll down. So now we see our covariance here, and it's different from zero. But again, I have to decide if that's a big number or a small number. And so I see now my slope's variance itself has gone down. That's a good sign. Um, and it's moved over here to the average. So our average slope across time is 0.11. That means that um, for each time point, for each month, the crime rate is increasing 0.11. So our intercept's gone down a little bit, but we, you know, if we start at 5.18, the next month we might expect to increase 0.11, so 5.29, and then the next month increase 5. Point, I can't math, okay, 40. Um, <clears throat> And so that's interpreted in the same way a traditional slope is interpreted. For every one unit increase in time, which is x here, we get slope unit increases in y, which is crime. Okay. Now, looking at my variance for the slope and the slope itself, is this a big number or not? Now, in many, um, in many st structural models, significance as p value column is not necessarily informative because we get these you know we get these super large samples and really small standard errors if we're doing a good job with our model so nearly everything is significant this is a really common problem and is 0.016 something practically that i should care about right so um first question does the addition of a fixed slope, an average slope, improve my model over a random slope? And you want that answer to be yes. That implies that there is this trend and that trend can be captured on average with our slope parameter. If this model is known better than the previous model, that means it's only random. Everybody's all over the place. There is no one good prediction line. So there's no one line of best fit. <coughs> so, okay, back to this question. Do I think that a variance here of 0.016 is a lot? Not really. 
that means that sometimes the slope, again, I'd have to take the square root to 0.04. If I take the square root, I, I'm not very good at square roots with decimals on top of my head. So, you know, that's what R is for. Okay. So I definitely did that the wrong direction. So do I think that that variant, that standard deviation, right, is large? Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> uh, so variance-wise, this seems really small, but I forget. You, ha you know, this is variance, not standard deviation. Um, so do I think that's a lot? Well, maybe, yeah. Okay. So you know, the slopes are changing quite a bit between different cities. Some cities are going up a lot more, some cities are not changing. So you got to think about this number in context of the, the slopes and the fact that this is variance and not uh, standard deviation. Right, because variance is hard to interpret because it's squared. What's the other question here? So people, oh, this negative covariance. All right. And so, you know, uh, so here's our negative correlation. Do I think that I can use correlation? I can understand that, right? Um, do I think that that is a large correlation? Eh, it's small, eh, small correlation, but it's negative. So the interpretation here is that people who start high Okay, so um, cities with high crime have um, flatter slopes than cities with lower crime. Okay. And when you stop and think about that, that makes sense. Because if I have a high crime rate already, one would hope that there is nowhere else up to go. Right? So if you're already making an A in a class, you use a ceiling, you can't go any higher. Right? So cities with high crime rates, you hope have slopes that are flatter because... Um, that means that the crime, while maybe still increasing, is not as increasing as fast as cities with low crime rates. Because they, if you have a low crime rate, if you have a spree, suddenly you have a, a large slope. Okay. Now, in practicality, we'd love for all of these to be negative. <laughs> negative slopes, but they're not. They're positive in this example. So people who have, are cities that have higher crime rates have flatter slopes. Cities with lower crime rates starting have, have slightly steeper slopes is the interpretation of that negative covariance. Now, is this model better? Yes. And that's a good thing, right? So it implies that having this single slope is better than just random slopes. Okay, this means the slope is different from zero and that that improves our model fit um, where, you know, having an average slope is a useful number. So this is a good thing. Last model. Oh, and then I have my parameter fit here. And so we can see what we want to see is this kind of, you know, it doesn't change super wildly because that implies that something's going wrong. Okay. But you'll see, hopefully, the residual variance will continue to go down because we're adding more predictors. We have more understanding of what's actually going on in the model, right? And then if the overall slope is better than a random slope, some of this variance will go down to, and covariance probably won't change a whole lot. Um, and it may be better to put the standardized parameter in here, but we're leaving everything as unstandardized. So let's see this last model. This is the fully or totally unconstrained model. And we're just gonna let the residuals do whatever they want. Now we want this model to be equal to our previous model because that implies that we're predicting well at each time point. Okay. A model with with um, freed residuals that are all different <laughs> implies heteroscedasticity. Right? We're better at predicting some time points than others. So that's an interesting question. You know, um, if it's heteroscedastic, why? Why can't we predict time four very well? Well, maybe it's because we need a curvilinear model. Um, and so that would actually show you you're bad at predicting maybe the beginning and the end. You're just, it's all flat. Right? Um, 
or a power model. So you predict a flat slope or a steep slope, and so some are better than others. So this would allow you to think about maybe why it's bad, try different models, what's the predictor that I'm missing, that kind of thing. But in a good data set, you have all the predictors, and we wouldn't want this to be a very good model or better than the previous model um, because that implies that the residuals are all different and you have to figure out why. And so for that one, you just take out all those constraints. So before we had time one, tilde, tilde, time one times time one. Now just take it out, see what happens. We had time one, tilde, tilde, r times time one. Let them do whatever they want. Now this actually adds several new parameters. And the model does improve, but um, it can't really be better than the last model because the last model was very close to ceiling already. And so let's look at our variances here. Now, these are all roughly similar. We're better at predicting time three than any of the rest of them, but these are all in the same neighborhood, which we don't, what would be bad to see is if time one was like 1.2 and time four was 0.01 or something, they're very different. And so they all roughly have the same approximate r squareds as well. So we're, we're actually doing pretty good. And with our final model, we would say this model is equivalent using our CFI rules. And notice how chi-square has slowly gotten lower and lower too. And that implies that our residual variances are approximately equal. So we have fairly equal prediction for each time, which is good. Now to do this, because I don't have a separate column for each residual variance. I just kind of pasted them all together. This is such a hack job, but I just kind of pasted them all together um, to, to grab that and just stick it all in one cell. All right, so now I can really think, right? It was 0.016 before when I averaged them all together and they're all hovering in this 0 0.11, 0 0.10 range, or 0.13 rather. And so they're all roughly equal. Okay, and it didn't um, really change much of our other parameters, so that's a good sign. All right, so the only other thing I wanted to point out that I think I missed pointing out here is I did have to change um, how some of these parameters are grabbed. Okay. So this one technically is I tilde tilde I because this one is I till day one. So you just kind of kind of uh, change a little bit how you grab them between models. Because once you hit model four, especially, you have multiple things that start with I and have two tildes, right? So this is the variance just for I, but now we have the covariance between I and S. So we have to make this distinction between these two paths. The first time I did it, I just said, okay, I tilde tilde, because there's only one, but now there's two of them. So just kind of paying attention to which one you want to grab. A kind of a cleaner, I thought about this later, but a cleaner way to do this may be to um, take the parameter table and paste together left-hand side, OP, and right-hand side. So you have just like the whole code, kind of what we did for multi-group models. We had like RS, tilde, tilde, RS, like one whole long piece. And then you just do one filter, right? You say I tilde one is the one I want. So there's a couple of ways to do this. You just, what I did to get to this was printed out, the, printed out the table and then figured out what my filter should be to get that exact number. Um, to put in a comparison table. Because it's really nice to not have to sort through the 600 pounds of Levon summary, right, that are mostly set to zero and one. It's much easier in a table however you want to format this table to go, you know what, our intercepts you know, is fairly, fairly invariant. That's not changing that much. Okay, our intercept variance really isn't changing, so probably a good thing to keep this parameter. Our residual variances are going down, that's great. But they're all roughly equal down here. Our slope mean is the same between both models, cool. Right, our so variance is not a whole lot, or if we take the square root, maybe it is a whole lot. And here's our covariance. So. I personally think the summary is not super useful in this particular set of models, except to make sure that it hasn't blown up. 
and that this kind of table is much better presentation. But feel free to copy my code here. So in summary, what have we learned? Well, latent growth modeling. Cool, no? It's a kind of a mix between um, traditional multi-level models in, you know, like LME4 and LME and our multi-group models. Okay? But instead of comparing groups, we're comparing time points. And that introduces us to this idea of random uh, intercepts and slopes. So if you're interested in multi-level Levon, you can, um, that's just what I Google and I look at the help page where I can account for, you know, measuring the same um, people or concepts over and over and over again, um, but not across time and actually build a multi-level like CFA, for example. And uh, an example of how I've how I've done that. How is it different than this latent group thing? Um, another example, just kind of help hopefully solidify how these are slightly different. Um, I have a friend who's doing work on um, personality, and they measured people on literally hundreds of items. <laughs> they just have so many um, uh, measurement points, like it is out of control. <laughs> And they're interested in controlling for the fact that each person saw all of those items. So they don't want to average the items, and the items aren't the squares in the model. There are other squares. So we controlled for the fact that their participants are in there hundreds of times. Okay? And just did uh, every item rating as one square on the model instead of having, um, you know, like, Question one is a square, question two is a square, question three is a square. Instead, we stack them all together and say, you know what, all of these are tied together because this is all participant number one and then participant number two. Okay. The other way to do that is to say all of these are tied together because this is item number one and item number two. Two approaches there. That's different than here's time one, time two, time three. Okay. Uh, but I can still do random intercepts and slopes for those types of models. And then how to go from most to least restrictive models in this sort of latent growth procedure. So now we have covered all of the models and their steps, right? Um, MTMM has steps. Uh, this has steps and multi-group models have steps. <laughs> so we've kind of covered the, the step comparison procedures. <laughs> um, and then more importantly, how to think about what these parameters mean. Right? So how to compare parameters and models to each other. So that's it for latent growth models for this um, for this lecture. In our next lecture, we're going to cover item response theory, which is kind of a, a twist on latent variable modeling. So we're actually going to briefly move away from Levon and talk about the um, LTM and the MERT package. But there's still latent variables. So there's still kind of structural models, um, but with a very different focus that I think you guys will like a lot because they're really um, interesting in what you can do with them. Also, they're one of the only places we're really going to touch on non-continuous data. Right, so what happens if my dependent variable is ordered? What can I do?